Hello, I am Nazi Khanishan from Horizon Weekly, and today we are privileged to once again be with the Right Honorable, the Baroness Cox of Queensbury. Baroness Cox, thank you for joining us today. Baroness Cox has sat under this title of the Lords since 1983. She is a crossbencher in the House of Lords and founder and CEO of Heart Humanitarian Aid Relief Trust. Her humanitarian work um, has taken her on many missions to several conflict zones, including um, Artsakh, where she has visited over 87 times. Um, these visits have allowed her to firsthand um, witness the human rights violation and humanitarian needs of these conflict zones. In recognition of her work in the international humanitarian and human rights arenas over the years, she has been awarded several times by many countries and international leaders, including the Mkhitaryan Gosh Medal by the President of Armenia, Robert Kocharyan, in 2006, as a strong supporter of the self-determination of the Armenians of Artsakh. Lady Cox has also been awarded an honorary, honorary fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeons of England and honorary doctorates by universities in the United Kingdom, the United States, Russia, and Armenia, and the list goes on. Baroness Cox, thank you again for being with us. It's, it's a privilege to be with you. Thank you. Baroness Cox, you have visited Artsakh over 87 times, and most recently you visited during the 45-day war against the indigenous Armenian population of Artsakh, where you witnessed firsthand the destruction and havoc caused by Azerbaijan. You were the first foreign official to visit Artsakh since the signing of the agreement on November 9th. Could you share with us your impressions um, and what that experience was like? Well, I only have time to share a few. I'll make available my full report for you to distribute it. But I think clearly it was a visit of great, great tragedy. This was ethnic religious cleansing, I would call it genocide in progress. Just I'll give three examples. Uh, the first is we visited Stepanakert uh, and we saw their war crimes, crimes against humanity, where Azerbaijan had deliberately targeted the maternity hospital while there were still operations going on in the basement. Uh, they targeted the electricity power station, which meant that people in basements and cellars couldn't have light or heat. They targeted many, many civilian institutions, which is a war crime. And of course, as we all know, they bombed the beautiful cathedral at Shushi twice. So there was the destruction. Then secondly, there was the poignancy of meeting uh, your people in Artsakh, and particularly when we were leaving from Artsakh to go back to Yerevan, normally about three or four hours, it took us 15 hours because the roads were just packed, packed with um, people fleeing the genocide. And it was heartbreak land because you could see people taking such as they had in terms of livestock. Um, they would burn their homes so they would not be available for desecration by the Azeris. And so we saw the burning homes and people weeping with those. And we also visited the beautiful historic monastery, uh, Dalivank, and we saw there people, we saw the last wedding to be held there and the poignancy of the situation there with that historic, beautiful place and its future unknown. And unfortunately, that seems to be the case because as a result of the, um, the agreement signed on November 9th, many Armenian historical and cultural, cultural immovable prominent monuments have fallen under the control of Azerbaijan, including churches, monasteries, kachkars, cross stones. Taking into account history and previous destructions at the hands of Azerbaijan, what do you believe is the fate of the Armenian Christian monuments, uh, many of which date back several centuries? Well, deeply, deeply worried, as I'm sure all Armenians are. One doesn't have to look back further than Nakitri Nak Bank. And there, of course, you had some of the most wonderful uh, Christian and historic and cultural monuments and buildings, and they were destroyed. The hatch cars were destroyed. Uh, beautiful churches were destroyed. A shooting practice place was built on the top, I think, of cathedral or one of the most important churches there. Everything Christian was destroyed and brutally and although it was condemned by the international community, uh, it remains destroyed. And there is a real fear that a similar uh, destruction of your precious religious and cultural sites may recur in Artsakh. And um, 
we are uh, deeply, deeply worried about that. And um, we met Father Johannes in the wonderful place in Daddy Bank, and there he was deeply was caressing your 800 year old hatch cars there. And you know, it would be another real tragedy if they were to fall victim to Azeri destruction. Absolutely, which is very unfortunate. Yeah. But may I just add one little thing? I mean, I love the spirit of your people. Remember at Daily Bank, obviously it was a time of huge tragedy. It was a penultimate day we would be allowed to be there and people were leaving and we witnessed say, the last marriage to take place there. And my colleague, Reverend David, uh, spoke to a young lady who looked rather inevitably distraught. So he spoke to her and her sisters joined her and they said, can we have a photograph with you? And David said, of course. They took the photograph and this was unbelievable. At the end they said, but were you smiling, Father David? He said, well, no, not here. He said, but in the house of God, we have to be happy. You have to smile. And to say that in the middle of the tragedy is just an amazing statement of a living faith. Absolutely. It's very heartwarming amid those tr tragic times. Um, Baroness Cox, in a recent article you wrote uh, in the tablet titled A Lesson in Faith and Hope in the Face of Adversity, um, you mentioned, and I will quote, but it was the people of nagorno karabakh who gave me heart and confirmed my faith. They do not just survive, they create beauty from ashes and destruction. During the dark days of war and uncertainty, there have been precious few threads of hope to cling onto, but this people's Christian faith shone through. Why was it so easy for the world um, to remain silent and indifferent during this war? And what is the message that you want to share with the world about the people of Artsakh? And what do you think they need to hear from them? Well, I think they need to hear from the people of Artsakh the reality of what Genocide Watch, independent organization, has called genocide by Azerbaijan. Uh, it fulfills the 10 criteria of genocide, and we've seen the evidence of that. So I think the world needs to know that, the world needs to hear it, and of course there's no one who can be better placed than the, the direct victims of that horrible uh, genocide, I'll use that word. So the world needs to hear their voice. But the problem is getting the voice out into the international media and into the international community. And one of the things that made me very angry was during that war, at the BBC news in the evening, there were three programmes, one after another, from Azerbaijan. And I got in touch with the director of the BBC news and said, this is not impartial. Uh, why aren't you covering from inside Karabakh? He said, we're, we're covering from Karabakh tonight. So they did, but nothing like the graphic uh, portrayal of what was happening for Azerbaijan. And I think even that programme finished in Azerbaijan. So there is a lot of media bias. And I think there's a great need, uh, particularly from the Armenian diaspora, and you have a very influential diaspora, to challenge the media, whether it's BBC here, or particularly in the States where you have a very powerful diaspora, or in Australia, to ensure that the media does cover the reality so that people know the seriousness and the tragic implications of what is happening. So it needs media coverage, it needs as many articles to be published as possible so people know. And at the moment, um, we've tried very hard. It's very difficult to get the truth out. Yes, and unfortunately, um, there's a lot of misinformation, like you said, that was being shared during that time as well. And of course, Azerbaijan has huge amounts of money and it spends masses on propaganda and its propaganda gets everywhere. And one of the things I would highlight amongst the Azerbaijan uh, situation <clears throat> is the dreadful phenomenon of hate speech. We have a lot of evidence of hate speech and that is utterly unacceptable. That, that should be definitely criminalized. Um, and I think examples of the hate speech need also to go out uh, because it was made very public. And even in the uh, celebration with President Elliott and President Erdogan, there were a lot of very, very aggressive uh, statements about the Armenian people. And that shouldn't go unchallenged. <clears throat> There should definitely be consequences uh, because we've found in history time and time again, those who deny or do not acknowledge their past are bound to repeat it. Exactly. And as long as they get away with impunity, then uh, they, they have every encouragement to repeat it. And just one of the most powerful things, one of our priorities in heart and in parliament is to highlight the plight of Armenian prisoners. 
uh, prisoners of war, but also civilians who'd been taken. And the atrocious treatment perpetrated upon them um, of torture, mutilation, humiliation, and killings, including beheadings. And that needs again to be out in the public domain. 100% unacceptable. And the hate speech underpins quite a lot of that. And one of the most poignant and I think cruel things was when we met uh, many of the uh, people who'd had to flee from Artsakh and we're in Armenia, we met a group who had been looked after very kindly by a church uh, near the border. And they said that one of the Azeri uh, policies was to take a prisoner's phone and then record on that phone <coughs> the torture, <coughs> excuse me, the maltreatment, the killing of the victim, and then send that back to their families. And I was speaking to ladies um, who's men folk, husbands, sons, fathers were missing. They said they hardly dared look at their phone for what they would see. And that is uh, utterly, utterly, and it was evil, I'd say it's evil. Yeah, it's quite inhumane on many levels. On many levels, yeah. Yes. Well, thank you, Baroness Cox, for sharing your insight. And I'm sure we there have so much more that we can um, learn and uh, from your experience as well. And for that, we'll take on your report um, and share it with our following as well. But um, we always appreciate your dedication, your continuous support, and your fight for the plight of um, the people of Artsakh and the Armenians of Artsakh. Well, I always say, and if you've heard me speak before, you will have heard me say it before, I think the world owes a debt of gratitude to the Armenian people for holding your front line of faith and freedom for the rest of the world. So we should be saying thank you to you. Thank you again. Thank you for making the time for us as well today.